Thank you very much, Mike, for the uh, kind introduction. And thank you indeed for coming along to hear me talk about um, how we might go about measuring quality in higher education. So most of my work is uh, focused on how we measure things from the student perspective, thinking about inequalities in education, uh, inequalities in uh, consequences of education. In other words, thinking about what education does for people in the labor market and how different people have different opportunities to access different kinds of education. But tonight I'm going to be focused on uh, my own sector, which is an interesting situation to be in. So for the last few years, I've been focused on research into higher education and how we might think about uh, the value of higher education from an economic perspective, but also how we measure quality in higher education. And that's an extremely challenging thing to do, I think. And it's even more challenging if you work in higher education, because whatever answer you come up with, you're unlikely to be popular with your fellow uh, members of faculty. Anyway, um, so the presentation I'm doing tonight, it draws on uh, a number of pieces of work, in particular two papers. One is with a team of researchers uh, that I collaborate with uh, at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, um, and also a team here at Cambridge, and particularly Professor Jan Vermont and Dr. Son Sonia Illy, who I work with, uh, looking at uh, measuring ga learning gain in higher education. So I'm going to talk about three things tonight. The first is explain to you why I even think it might be needed to measure um, quality in higher education. Um, for some, particularly those of you perhaps who experienced higher education that you thought was lacking in places, you might think it's obvious we should measure quality in higher education and certainly quality of teaching and learning. But I think for many, uh, higher education is different from, say, school education. And there is a question about whether we even need to think about higher education in the times of terms that I'm going to be talking about it, and certainly whether or not we should be measuring it in, in terms of quality. There is an argument that to focus on quality might be, in, and certainly trying to measure it with quantitative metrics, might be quite a reductionist thing to do for something that is, after all, higher and therefore a much uh, more ambitious and broad endeavor than, say, school education. But I would point out that um, we have spent a number of years trying to think about how we measure quality in the school system. And so I think for those of us working in higher education, we have to have a good argument if we're going to say that the, the rules don't apply to us and that somehow we are exempt from any attempts to think about uh, what it is that we do and the value of what we do, both to students and to others. But I'm going to have a go at this, and I'm going to talk about two ways that are currently being considered or actually used to measure quality in higher education. They both have major limitations, and I'm going to discuss that tonight. So first of all, we can think of what higher education does for students. In other words, how it influences and impacts on their outcomes, and particularly for many students. Uh, the major goal after they leave university is to get a good job. And so we can think about what higher education does for students in that respect and whether that is a sensible thing to measure as a mark of quality. Um, but I'm also going to make the case that we need to think about this slightly differently and we need to think about the learning that goes on in higher education because, after all, that is what our higher education institutions are primarily there for, for learning, and talk about some of the challenges of doing that. But before we get started on how you measure these things, um, just think for a moment about why it is that we're going about uh, trying to measure it in the first place. So one of the main drivers of uh, my work at the moment is that the regulatory environment for higher education has changed and that there is a growing demand, certainly from government, possibly from students, possibly from their parents, to do a better job of... Uh, communicating what it is that students will get when they go to higher education and possibly even uh, trying to assess the quality of the provision that they get uh, when they get here. Um, it's true that we've had regulation of higher education for a very long time, actually, um, but the first sort of major piece of regulation that really kind of hit the sector was on the research front. We had what was originally called the research assessment exercise, uh, attempts to measure the quality of the research that academics produce and institutions produce, and it was linked to funding. So those who did higher quality research, as judged by peer review, uh, 
ended up getting higher levels of funding. It's now called something different, a research excellence framework, but the principle is the same. And those principles are quality leads to better resourcing, and quality is judged by peer review. The criticism of this kind of regulation increasingly over the years has been that what it's done is take academics' natural focus on their research and magnified it. In other words, academics were always probably rather focused on their research rather than the needs of their students, potentially, except maybe here. Um, but they're directing their efforts to their research more than ever because their careers and uh, the funding that their university gets very much depends on the quality of their research. So the research excellence framework, if you like, has been successful. It's certainly focused uh, minds on quality of research, but increasingly people are wondering whether that might be at the expense of teaching. And what we're seeing is that with the introduction of tuition fees um, and a sort of new era where students are leaving institutions with sort of large amounts of debt, albeit income contingent debt, but nonetheless debt, there's um, a growing sense that we need to think about what they're getting in terms of value for money. And I think the other aspect of it is that students are getting uh, uh, more informed and more uh, focused on making choices in higher education. So one of the other pressures that's being brought to bear on the system is the desire to have better information uh, given to students about what they might expect from different options when they get into higher education. Now, of course, underneath this is a sort of slightly uncomfortable tension, actually. Are we thinking of students as consumers, buying something, needing information about the quality of the, the product? Uh, well, hardly, because obviously, actually, higher education, and indeed any kind of education, is uh, a joint endeavor between institution, teacher, and student. Um, so another way of thinking about it, and certainly the way economists think about higher education, is as an investment. That also has issues and problems because many people do their higher education not to get any better job or better earnings in the labor market, but just for the enjoyment of the subject or for other non-monetary reasons. But nonetheless, even if we just say for a moment that there are two views of higher education between students as consumers and students as investors, you can see that that creates a bit of a tension as to what kind of information we should be giving students and indeed how should we even think about measuring quality. So what's actually happening is we have a shift in our regulation um, of teaching in higher education. Now, we've always had regulation of teaching, contrary to some people's views about <laughs> whether or not academics have been held to account for the quality of their teaching. Theoretically, at least, we've always had some sort of a quality assurance regime, or at least in the last 30, 40 years. Um, so uh, it's not true to say that academics could do what they want, but I guess there was a sense that that was a relatively uh, soft regime uh, and maybe that it didn't provide sufficient incentive for institutions to hone in on their teaching quality and therefore by implication uh, for academic individual academics to focus on teaching. And bear in mind the pressures from the REF, from the Research Excellence Framework, it tended to push academics towards the research side of things rather than the teaching side of things. While that has all potentially changed in the last few years, we now have a different framework. Uh, we have two things that are worth noting. The first is we now have something called the Teaching Excellence Framework, technically Teaching Excellence and Student Outcomes Framework. Um, and that is supposed to be the corollary to the research one. And the idea is that we're going to start measuring teaching quality in higher education institutions. And that will balance up the REF and the TEF so that we encourage academics and institutions to focus not just on the research that they produce, but also the quality of the teaching and the learning uh, that they have in their institutions. Um, that's important, but even more important, perhaps, is the fact that we now have a new regulator. It's called the Office for Students. It's independent. It's providing a new regulatory framework. It's early days to see what they're going to do, but um, people have reported it as being much closer to, say, the Ofsted model, which regulates schools, uh, than the previous quality assurance agency. So what's happened with TEF, the Teaching Excellence Framework? Uh, we have now got an England-wide assessment of teaching quality in higher education or teaching quality in student outcomes. Um, it does attempt to uh, assess student outcomes um, in two main ways. One is where students go after they leave higher education, 
Um, and the other is in terms of uh, how students feel uh, that the, the quality of their education met up, met with their expectations. And institutions now get awards, it's rather crude, gold, silver, bronze, um, but the aim is to, to give guide, uh, guidance to students as to whether they think they're about to enrol in a, in a high quality institution in terms of teaching, and also to obviously encourage institutions to focus more on their teaching. So, um, I'm not going to say a huge amount about the TEF, but what I think will say is it's an independent panel. Um, so it is sort of peer review in the sense that it, it, there's a panel of people making judgments, um, but it's based on metrics as well as qualitative judgment. And I think it's worth highlighting the main metrics that the framework uses. Um, first of all, students staying the, the course, not dropping out is the first one. Uh, secondly, where they go to afterwards, types of jobs they do whether they're high-skilled jobs, how much they earn, and then students' views from the National Student Survey. You'll notice that teaching doesn't appear in that list. And um, I think it's important to note that, as yet, the TEF doesn't directly measure teaching quality. Um, it also gives uh, relative judgment, so the ranking is one institution relative to another. And I say that because what it aims to do is take account of the fact that different students enrol in different institutions. So it's quite difficult to compare um, you know, a Russell Group uh, economics degree and where those students might go with, say, a nursing degree in a, a university that tends to provide for students who enrol locally. How would you make those comparisons? And TEF attempts to do that. It's currently under review by Dame Shirley Pierce. I'm providing some statistical advice to the review, but all views tonight are very much my own. So what is it that we actually want to measure? Well, potentially we might want to measure teaching quality. And certainly in the school system for many years, Ofsted used to go into classrooms and try and observe what teachers did with the idea that we could recognize teaching quality when we see it. Um, I'm not sure that was uh, entirely successful. I think it's quite difficult for us to agree what teaching quality looks like. And also pedagogy and what quality looks like does vary by subject. Uh, the maths teachers in the room will have quite a different view uh, to those who are working in arts and humanities as to what quality might look like. So um, th there is a question about whether we can measure it directly. We might also think that um, although higher education is about far more than just getting a job, um, it's certainly true that for students, this is a major decision in their lives and that we would like them to make informed decisions and so, to some degree, when we're thinking about a, um, a measure that's supposed to inform student choice, we do actually have to think about how it contains information that would be useful to students, and in particular, where, where they're likely to end up if they take that degree, both in terms of job type, but also in terms of their earnings. But maybe the third aspect is the one that I'm really interested in, which is what we would ultimately like is not so much to observe teaching quality and make a judgment as to whether that approach is better than another approach, but perhaps what we actually want to do is think about the learning that happens in higher education. And if institutions are going to be held accountable for anything, presumably it is the learning that students um, undertake whilst they're in their university. And so one of the questions that we had in our research project was, is it possible to develop a consistent measure across subjects, across institutions that could capture student learning. You may be sitting there going, well, don't we have that? Because students take lots of exams, and clearly we have a lot of assessment of subject knowledge. Uh, that's true. But the notion that higher education institutions are independent means that we all have quite different curricula. And so those kinds of assessments are not necessarily useful if we think it's important to be able to compare across institutions. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So let's start with um, the relatively simple way of measuring um, one aspect of higher education, but it's also perhaps the most controversial. So first of all, we need to think about whether or not institutions are the only factor that impacts on individuals' labor market outcomes. They're clearly not. But what we would like to know is, if a student with a particular profile goes to a particular institution, where are they likely to end up in terms of the labor market? I think it's important that we recognize that labor market outcomes are not teaching quality, and they're not necessarily learning. Uh, what they do capture, however, is 
uh, the outcomes from that learning and the skills that individuals have. And so I think there are two ways that we might use um, earnings information or indeed employment job, job profiles uh, information. Uh, the first is to help students understand where typical students from that course end up. So in other words, if you are starting out, particularly if you're coming from a family that has not had experience of higher education before, there is a bewildering array of, array of courses. It has changed an awful lot since you and I went through the higher education system. Uh, the numbers of courses on offer has multiplied. Uh, the navigation of that system is difficult and complex. And the labor market has also got, um, in some respects, tougher in, in certain elements. And so the question is, um, do students need good information to make decisions? Not so much that the earnings consideration will be the only factor that determine which subject they, they study, far from it, but to have some insights into the kinds of work and the kinds of earnings they can expect after they graduate. There's also uh, a far more uh, prosaic uh, you know, reason to, to measure earnings, and that is because we have a system of funding where uh, students get loans. Those loans are income contingent. So you only repay your loan for your higher education if you earn enough. And that's obviously a, a much uh, fairer system in the sense that you're not exposing the individual student to huge amounts of risk. So if they don't do well in the labor market as a result of their degree, even though they're leaving now with, say, 30, 40,000 pounds worth of debt, they're not going to repay it. Um, and they have the security of knowing that it's not like a mortgage. Right? And they're not going to end up bankrupt because they can't repay it. This is clearly a good thing. But of course, the implication of that is that um, the taxpayer is going to be subsidizing those who don't repay. And we think only about half uh, of the debt will be repaid. So there's a fair amount of public subsidy that's actually not very visible to the public going into higher education. And uh, one uh, you know, objective with, with looking at earnings is to just understand where that subsidy is going. And that means you can have a sensible discussion about whether you want it to go there. For example, clearly, we would like to subsidize nursing courses. We need more nurses. The social good from nursing is huge. They are unlikely to repay their loans because nurses are not paid that much. But we, as a society, would most clearly like to subsidize that course. So having some earnings information can help to, with those decisions. So how have we gone about doing it? Um, we have a, a new data set uh, called the Longitudinal Educational Outcomes Database. And what it is, is it's a, a census. It's a data set that enables us to follow children as they progress through the education system from primary into secondary, on into higher education, and then out the other side into the labor market. And because we have people's entire trajectory, we can start asking simple questions like, you know, what's the difference in earnings between graduates and non-graduates? Um, but we can also ask perhaps more sophisticated questions, which is, if you take two students with very similar profiles, very similar levels of achievement at A level, and one of them goes in one direction, and one of them goes in another direction, either in terms of subject or in terms of institution, where do they end up? What kinds of jobs do they end up in? And crucially, what do they earn? So the data set is, um, is quite rich in the sense that it contains the entire educational trajectory of these children, and that's really useful. Um, it does also have some demographic information, such as ethnicity, social background. So we can also ask questions, as indeed we have, which is, for example, what kinds of institutions and what kinds of courses are poorest students more likely to enroll in, um, even when they get the same A-level grades as other kinds of students? So just to blind you with the science for a moment, uh, for the statisticians amongst you, uh, this may look familiar. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with the methodology, I'll just explain it. The um, idea here is that if you compare the earnings of Cambridge graduates with the earnings of uh, University of Westminster graduates, for example, you will see that there's a big difference in the level. It will not come as a surprise. But much of that difference is because Cambridge tends to enroll students who at A-level have two A-stars, three A-stars. And University of Westminster takes students who have, on average, lower A-level grades. So comparing their earnings is not very meaningful. So what we're trying to do here is say, 
what we actually want is to take two individuals with a similar profile, similar A-level grades, similar, if you like, uh, academic potential at that point, and then make the comparison between those two individuals rather than comparing everybody. So in our model, we call this a value-added model. The reason why it's value-added is because the idea is that you're taking account of where people start, say A-levels, and then you're asking where do they get to in terms of earnings, and can I make comparisons across institutions and courses where they take in very, very similar students. And the models there are just illustrating it. So on the left-hand side of the, all the equations, you have earnings. In this case, it's in log form, but that's not that important. So you have earnings, and you're explaining it with three things. You're explaining it with subject, which is the SUB subject. You're explaining differences in earnings by institution, which is the uni variable. But you're also explaining differences by other factors that you want to take account of, that if you like, you want to kind of put on one side and say, I've taken account of that. And that is the X set of variables there, which are the um, things like socioeconomic status, SES, uh, where, uh, this, where they're located in terms of their schooling, ethnicity, what type of school they go to, but most importantly of all, prior attainment. And we're talking here A-level subjects or equivalent at that level, and A-level grades or equivalent. So the idea behind these models is they do get close to saying, given a set of um, A-level subjects and, and level of qualification, what, is, what are your earnings? And let's have a look at the differences by subject. So you're comparing like with like. We're focused on those, obviously, in work because we're looking at their earnings. And we are having a, a minimum cutoff of those with five A stars to GC, A stars to C GCSE, because those are the most likely to be um, uh, enrolling in higher education. In terms of the statistics, what we're doing with the methodology is um, got a fancy name, but it's actually quite straightforward. It's called inverse probability weighted regression, and the logic here I think is quite straightforward. If you have two individuals and they're quite similar, it makes for a better comparison than if you have two individuals that are quite different. And the idea is that you can empirically make sure that your group in, uh, that's getting your university or subject of interest and the one that you're comparing with are very, very similar. And to do that, what we do is we calculate the likelihood of a student being able to take a course. Okay? So in other words, you work out the probability of being able to take that course from a bunch of different students, and you're trying to make sure that your comparison is made up of students that are very, very similar in terms of their prior qualifications in particular. That's great. So statistically, what we can do is make sure that our, our we call it our treatment and our control are very, very similar, just as you would in a, a science experiment. But there is a, 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 a caveat, and that's a really important caveat, and it's the last bullet point. I'm trying to convince you that with our data, we can be sure that we're comparing like with like. We have students with similar A-levels, similar A-level subjects, similar grades, similar ethnicity, similar socioeconomic background. So any differences in earnings that I observe, I'm arguing, are down to the subject they take and the institution that they attend. That's the value added of the subject and the value added of the institution. But if people who take some courses are systematically different for whatever reason, it is still possible that we won't be getting the value added of the institution. What we'll be doing is capturing whatever it is that makes these people different. And maybe the best way to illustrate this is to take my own original discipline, which was economics. Uh, economics has been called the dismal science. My husband assures me every day that economists are naturally quite pessimistic people. Um, but they're also quite rational. Uh, they learn about labor markets, and they get quite focused on employment and earnings, one would imagine, given their training. I'm generalizing here. But you could imagine that economists, even if they look the same as those who have opted to study history, uh, they have the same A-levels, they have the same grades. In my data, we're comparing the two. But maybe there's something about economists that make them particularly focused on labor market, that they're making the kinds of decisions about their careers that are quite, quite career-focused, quite utilitarian, right? And maybe historians 
do history for the love of it. And maybe those two people are not completely comparable. So although I'm going to present you with some numbers and some comparisons, I think probably important to bear that in the back of your mind, that we can never be sure that we're completely allowing for everything. And the most likely thing that might affect some of our results is whether some particularly subject choices are made on the grounds of things we can't observe. So having, having given you, I hope, a, a flavor of the, um, the methodology that we're using, um, what has LEO, as we call our data, told us? So um, we measure um, the impact of uh, a degree on people's earnings. It's called a return in the same way that you would make an investment in, in a bank. You're, you're calculating the return on the investment you make. And the earnings premia, the earnings return, are indeed very large for women. They're much smaller for men on average, but they're still very positive. So if you've read in the newspaper that degrees are not worth the paper they're written on, if you've read in the newspaper that degrees are not worthwhile financially, uh, worse if you're telling your children that or grandchildren, um, it's not true. Um, the value of a degree, particularly for women, remains very high. The value of a degree, even for men, remains significant and positive. And what we also see are very, very big differences in earnings by subject. Now, some of those differences are not because of the subject. Some of the differences in earnings that we observe are down to the fact that different people enroll in different subjects. So if you're enrolling in physics and economics and uh, data science, you tend to have very high levels of mathematical skill. If you're enrolling in more creative um, subjects, of drama, etc., you have somewhat lower, on average, levels of mathematical skills. So that you can't necessarily compare those two groups. When we do compare like with like, uh, subject differences remain very important, but the magnitude of the, the differences is around about half. And similarly, what we also observe is differences in earnings by institution. And again, massive differences in the earnings, as I've given already, between, I don't know, London School of Economics and another institution that's serving a local community. Very, very big differences. But most of that, or a lot of that, I should say, more accurately, is down to the prior attainment and the characteristics of students. So that is a, a qualitative summary of what the data has told us, but I thought you might like to see some pictures. Always easier to see things in data. So um, this is giving you uh, mean earnings, real mean earnings, uh, for men, uh, sorry, women, I beg your pardon, uh, in 2017. And we're basically comparing the green line, which are those who go to university, with uh, the blue line, which is those who have at least five A stars to C, but who don't go to university. This is just a very crude description. It's not designed to do anything other than to point out one really, really important thing. You'll notice that actually graduates earn less than non-graduates at the early stage in their career, obviously because they're students and because when they get their first job, they're probably still doing a lot of training. They may not get high pay immediately, but they soon overtake. And you can see that for men too. At a slightly um, older age, men overtake uh, or graduates overtake non-graduates. That trajectory is really important because it means that when you measure people's earnings really matters to the conclusions that you're going to draw about the value of a degree, right? So if you look at people too early, you're not going to capture the full benefits of a degree. And uh, in terms of our data, we've got earnings from when graduates are age 29. So we think we're past this, this curve bit but we still want to observe them later in life when, when we're able to. So now the bit that maybe some of you who uh, went to university and took different subjects might be interested in are these are earnings premia, again for women, and split out by different subject. I'm hoping you can read the subjects along the bottom. Um, the first thing is it's all relative to not going to higher education at all, which is a flat line because these are expressed as wage premia. So in other words, it's the percentage gain in earnings or percentage premium in earnings that you have when you take a particular subject. Now, the black dots are the raw differences. So the black dots can be interpreted in the following way. If we go up here to economics, uh, my subject, but I'm not in that dot, just to be clear. Um, <laughs> economists up here earn around about 150% more than a non-graduate. But as I said earlier, um, some of these differences are down to the kinds of people that take different subjects. 
Okay? And what the red dots do is they apply our inverse probability weighted regression model. They allow for lots of characteristics. They chomp the numbers and come up with a premium that is adjusted for the characteristics of students. And so I would argue that this red uh, premium is a better guide as to the relative wage premium associated with that subject in comparison with um, others. So, for example, you'll notice that the premium from medicine and economics comes down markedly. Well, obviously, as you know, particularly in the case of medicine, uh, it's, it's one of the most demanding subjects. Some of our most highly qualified A-level students go into medicine. When you compare like with like, the premium come down. And you can see along here, you get some subjects that the differences are somewhat uh, muted in terms of comparisons across different subjects. I mean, yes, it is still true that many of the sort of science and maths or oriented ones up here have slightly higher premia. And what is also true is that social care, creative arts, et cetera, have very low premia. But I would highlight the social care result. And also, we've got nursing somewhere in here, if I can find it, nursing. Um, just remember, we are only measuring earnings. We are not measuring the social value. And so uh, it shouldn't come as a surprise that social care is going to be low paid because it's a public sector role by and large and we don't pay well. So that's for men, which um, looks similar. Just draw your attention to two features. One, you'll notice the premium are lower. As I said at the beginning, the wage advantage for women is much greater. You might be wondering why. Bear in mind that obviously, well not obviously, but sadly women earn considerably less than men in the labour market, and that's still true for graduates. But these comparisons will be saying, what does a female graduate earn in comparison with a female non-graduate? And non-graduate females are in, on average, very low paid jobs. So the advantage of being a graduate for a woman is greater. Um, pattern is not wildly different in terms of subject. Uh, for men or for women, and you get the same result that the premium come down somewhat. I guess you might be worrying about this, um, or not, who knows. Uh, so those are, on average, negative premium compared to non-graduates, and uh, we might think that some of that is because you've selected into occupations that have a very strong non-monetary component, uh, you know, drama, singing, creative arts. These are professions that perhaps you go in for the love of it. Um, but if you're just looking at um, where you end up, you earn less. Now we can look by institution. I've resisted um, putting the names of every institution on the slide. If you're interested and you want to look up your alma mater, then the Institute for Fiscal Studies has all this data in interactive form, and you can go and uh, look at your own institution if that's of interest to you. I don't think the real interest is in the sort of minutiae of differences between institution. I think what's really interesting is you get this ranking. Um, all these institutions are ranked by the, the premier, and it, it, you know it's a, it's a fairly steep curve. But actually, a lot of that is because we have a higher education system that almost perfectly sorts individuals into institutions on the basis of their A-level grades. And so when you take account of that, the fact that some institutions are enrolling students with far higher levels of prior attainment, and you say, what is the premier when you would account for that? Uh, the relationship is much less steep. I mean, you still have uh, some outliers, and Cambridge is that one, uh, um, Oxford. Um, but nonetheless, the, the, the premier is someone less. Now, you might also have noticed uh, the location of the three that I've put on the slide. I didn't put Bolton on the slide to give it a hard time. I put it on to illustrate the point about geography. So a lot of the London institutions end up towards the top of the, the curve. And so for us, that's really important because if you're going back to the essay question, which is how do we measure the value added of higher education institutions and are these data useful to do so, well, one of the big questions is, if by being located in London, your students are far more likely to get a job in London, and if London salaries are considerably higher than others, then obviously this is going to come out in the data in a particular way. It doesn't necessarily tell you much about the institution in terms of quality. Similar pattern for men, just to illustrate the point. So what do I think this piece of work could be used for in terms of thinking about higher education 
quality. So I think the first thing that I hope I've stressed enough is the estimates we have of the value added of institutions are guides to what we think the institution might be doing for that student in terms of giving them the skills that might help them in the labour market. But they're not causal. We can't be sure um, that it's down to the institution. As I said, if all the economists are fundamentally more career-focused, should we you know, give LSE the credit for uh, them having higher earnings, or should we say, no, it was down to the individuals? Um, I think the other thing that's really important is that these data need to be used very carefully because we're completely ignoring the non-monetary and social value of higher education. Uh, nursing's an, uh, an obvious example, but there are subtler examples of, you know, the value of history, for example, is immeasurable when it think, comes to things like public policy. Um, so these, these degrees are very valuable and, and we're ignoring non-monetary aspects of it. The other thing we're, in this um, kind of work is that if universities themselves, as engines of growth, as some people have described them, have an impact on their local environment over and above what they do for their students, then we're only capturing some of it when we look at the labour market outcomes. So if you have a local university in Sunderland or uh, in Bolton and their graduates may not be earning that much, but the university itself is uh, uh, providing tech or creating jobs and providing a hub for businesses to interact with, there might be an awful lot of economic value, actually, that's not being um, assessed here. And the question is, you know, are, are we ignoring it at our peril? But I think the really important thing from an economist's perspective is to, to be much clearer about what earnings are measuring. So they reflect the supply and demand in the labour market, and that's why they're useful for students. I don't think a student should make a decision on their higher education purely on the basis of earnings. I certainly wouldn't expect my children to. But I do like them to know what they're getting themselves into. And so what they're doing is giving a signal as to what the labour market values. And the labour market values, as you could see from those subject rankings, analytical skill, it still values mathematics skill, it still values science, it still values, um, you know, more vocationally oriented degrees, medicine, economics, business studies. Uh, it, it's not a value judgment as to whether those degrees are better, um, but that's currently what uh, uh, the labour market seems to be demanding. The other thing is that we talked about teaching quality and the fact that maybe the TEF doesn't have that explicitly in any of its metrics. Well, one thing you need to be cautious about with earnings, of course, is that they, if they do measure anything at all, measure what happened 10 years previously, right? Because you went through an institution, you left, you got a job, we observed you at the age of 29 in the labour market and we said, look, you went to that institution and the wage premium you got was 30% compared to a non-graduate. Well, that's all true, but whatever your earnings premium at the age of 29, it reflected what was going on in that institution you know, 10 years or so earlier. So again, that's not current quality. It's what's happened in the past and sometimes that gets forgotten when people are talking about earnings. So... Um, I'm quite an advocate for providing students with information. So for me, uh, just because earnings don't capture everything of value of higher education, I think they're still useful. But I would also argue that one has to use them very carefully and, more crucially, that they're not capturing some of the things that we do want to think about. And the main thing I think that we want to think about is what is it that universities do in terms of the learning of their students? So for the second half of this talk, I'm going to focus on learning and learning gain. So this is a project um, that we started about five years ago now. Um, and again, it was very much in the frame of um, thinking about how it is that we would, as a sector, want to measure what it is that we do. So in other words, rather than just accepting that we're going to be measuring our quality in terms of our student dropout rate or in terms of earnings, what is it that we think we might want to do as a sector to kind of reflect our values and reflect what it is that we think higher education is all about? So that was rather a grand ambition. Uh, I'm sure we haven't achieved all of what we've set out to do, but nonetheless, it's been a really interesting exercise. And I'll just describe to you what we did. So our goal here was um, to think about, can we develop an instrument, a test, an assessment? I don't want to use, use the word test or assessment because... As you'll see, it's not really a test specifically, but it's a, it's a way of measuring learning 
across a number of different subjects. And obviously, if we're going to do that, um, there are three uh, important sort of considerations to take into account. We can't just uh, you know, invent something and hope that it's going to measure what it is that we want to measure. And the three considerations are reliability. So essentially, if we have um, an assessment or, or an instrument, um, if we give it to uh, another set of students, it's got to produce the same result. It's got to be reliable. Otherwise, we can't be sure that it's going to tell us what, what it is that we think it, it should tell us. It's got to be valid. And by that, I mean it's actually got to measure what it is that we're interested in. And one can argue that earnings, for example, are not necessarily a valid measure of teaching quality because they don't actually necessarily measure what it is that we're interested in, which is teaching quality. Now, here we're interested in measuring the learning of students, so our instruments got to capture that. And um, because I'm a fairly practical person and the work is designed to inform policy, for us it was also important that this was something that could be used. And if it's going to be used, it needs to be used at scale, so it's got to be uh, something that you could consider doing across a number of universities or a number of subjects. It's got to be practical. Um, and what we were trying to do is whether we could develop a model of longitudinal learning gain. In other words, whether we could capture the gains that people have over time um, and think about how they related to student backgrounds and, and institutions and contextual factors. So there's a, a large literature on what it is that we think higher education does for individuals. And when I say large, actually massive. Um, so we could spend a long time debating which particular aspects of higher education are more or less important. But I think what that literature really does suggest is that higher education does an awful lot. It is a very broad endeavor, and both those working in higher education and students see higher education as providing skills, providing abilities, providing competencies. Um, and it's a real major challenge trying to just cover such a breadth of potential outcomes from higher education, um, covering them in a way that you actually end up with something solid at the end of it that is comparable. Um, I think there are a number of areas, though, that people kind of hone in on and see as the kind of natural outcomes from higher education. Critical thinking, which I should have done this already, a blind test if you ask people what higher education does for people. Critical thinking is normally quite near the top of the list. It's mentioned by many universities. It's certainly, if you measure it, it's correlated with university exams and, and graduation. So it's clearly something institutions do focus on. Uh, increasingly, people talk about engagement and satisfaction. Probably 30, 40 years ago, I don't know if we expected students to enjoy it, I'm not sure. But now, there's a certain sense that um, we want them to have a good academic experience. And um, it's interesting that this is, this is a measure that's quite distinct from, say, critical thinking, because it's not actually that correlated with some of the more traditional outcomes, such as degree class, for example. So it is something quite distinct. And then we have um, general knowledge and discipline-specific knowledge. And uh, most degrees are a mix of both of those things. And the universities themselves have a lot of uh, internal assessment that get at the last two, much less um, uh, on, the, on the first two. And of course, much of what happens inside universities is not comparable across universities. So what we did is we developed this instrument, this, this assessment, uh, we used 12 different questionnaire scales to, to put it together. Some of those were new. Some of those were existing scales that we adapted. And then we took 11 universities. Uh, they were Russell Groups bar one, um, because the project was originally uh, part of a Russell Group project. Um, and we tested whether or not um, our instrument could really measure learning gain that was going on in universities. And um, we wanted a mix of students, so we've got undergraduate and postgraduate, and we wanted a mixture of subjects. So we've got yeah, business, chemistry, English, and medicine. To give you some idea of uh, kind of what we did in practice, so we start with the, the literature review and developing the theoretical framework, which was informed uh, largely by existing work, but also by an equalitative element where we interviewed students, and indeed we actually, it doesn't say it up there, we interviewed staff about what they saw as the prime aims of higher education. And then with the instrument developed, we then tested it on thousands of students. Um, 
over a, a two-year period, as you can see. And at the end of it, not only do we have uh, data from three time points on thousands of students uh, on this instrument, but also we were then able to link it to the student's administrative student record. So in other words, this HISA matching, as it's called, um, this is their record of whether they graduate, what degree class they got, et cetera, and some of their outcomes from higher education, including which job they go to. So down the line, again, what we can do is think about how uh, students um, kind of reporting on our, tool or our instrument relate to their eventual outcomes. Now, this is the conceptual framework that we developed, and um, don't worry, we didn't try and measure all of this, but this is what um, the literature and staff and students essentially told us was important to higher education and an important uh, asset or aspect, I should say, of higher education. So um, most of you would have focused on the cognitive aspect. Obviously, I think that's well known, the critical thinking, analytical thinking, et cetera, et cetera. So these, I guess, are the more conventional ways of thinking about what higher education might do for an individual. But this is increasingly recognized as very, very important. The point about higher education being different from school, right? So this is where you learn to think about your learning. And it may be this metacognitive component where you're actually thinking about how you learn, your attitude to learning, uh, thinking about how you regulate your learning, how you regulate your own behavior. In the future, when you change jobs and your specific um, knowledge may be less useful, it may be that it's that metacognition that really matters in terms of your future development. Then there's an attitudinal aspects, um, motivation, engagement, um, you know, how you feel about yourself, your studies, and your work which is obviously also seen as, as quite distinct for higher education. And then finally, um, the social aspect of it, um, where people talk about higher education as providing some sort of social community, social embeddedness, um, and in that, how you relate to others, how you, you know, form part of a community, including communication skills, etc. And then running along the bottom are things that, uh, a lot of this came from staff, things that we think of are associated with universities in particular. You might have had this picture even if you weren't thinking about university learning. Uh, here we have some aspects, epistemology, uh, research focus, uh, maybe not moral reasoning, but open-mindedness, et cetera, that we think are very distinct to higher education, and they came through very strongly. So this is what, if you like, the sector thinks it's doing in terms of the learning of its students. Now, we can't measure all of that, and some of it's been done before. This is what we ended up focusing on. We wanted to focus on a range so that we covered some of these different components. Um, but we couldn't do everything, and this is what we ended up with. So some of these are fairly obvious. So you know, reasoning ability, IQ type measures, and the rest were often uh, self-report, where the individual reflects on their learning and gives us answers regarding um, how much they've improved over time. Um, if you're interested in reading more, that's the paper. It's been published in Higher Education Pedagogies, and it gives you the detail. So what did we learn from this exercise, apart from you've got, uh, I think, quite a nice conceptual theory there, but actually measuring it is, is the hard part. Uh, one of the first things we learned is that uh, student engagement is a real challenge. And um, our project did pretty well on this front, mainly because of my amazing colleague, Dr. Sonia Illy, who administered the uh, questionnaire and was persistent and wonderful and did an awful lot to engage students. But there were a number of other projects that were doing similar kind of work to ours at the, other, at the same time. And they, they essentially failed because they couldn't get students to engage. And you think, oh, well, that's a methodological problem with research. It's not. It's actually quite core to thinking about how we as a sector would measure what we do if we can't get students to engage in thinking about what they've learned. So one um, thing I've mentioned earlier is that um, the TEF uses uh, national student survey responses. Well, they're created by students asking students questions and getting them to fill in forms. And getting students to respond is difficult. And so we get quite biased, potentially quite biased numbers from them. Um, most of the scales that we used were reliable, not all of them. Um, for those of you, again, who are statistical or who are interested in psychology, um, what we have here is um, a reliability indicator. 
which takes a value of zero if it's very bad and one if it's, it's perfect. Um, as you can see, most of them are 0.7 or above. The exception here was epistemological beliefs, which basically means it's not a very reliable measure and we had to drop it. We were unable, and we had two goes at this, we were unable to really measure that aspect of people's learning. But on all of these other elements, and there's quite a broad range there, we succeeded um, to a large degree in finding something that was reliable and we would argue valid because these are what the sector thinks it's doing, so therefore valid measures of student learning. Um, and um, we were quite pleased with that result. So just to give you something concrete so you can see what I'm talking about, um, this is a self-assessment one in um, item, or set of items. You ask students about uh, drawing conclusions and critical interpretations, etc. They get to answer this on, on a scale, uh, with a higher number being um, more likely to do something and a lower number being less likely to do something. And then we can use that to determine, um, in this case, their critical processing of information. Now, this is one where students are reporting how they respond and how they feel. Um, some of them required uh, more direct calculation, like I, more IQ type um, uh, measures, and so it was a mixture of the two. Okay, and um, we were then able to obviously plot from round to round. Uh, so just taking critical processing as an example, um, I think the, the key point here is the PhD levels of critical processing come in much higher than year one undergraduate. So that's reassuring. It would be worrying if it was the other way around. Um, there's also some progression. Um, on this scale, it's not very visible exactly you know, the, the extent of the progression. Um, but notice, particularly on the undergraduates, not much progression between year and one and year two. And indeed, on some of the learning, for example, some of the engagement, we find students getting less engaged in year two. And that kind of makes sense. Anybody who's done uh, or teaching in higher education knows that students get the second year dip. Um, and then, you know, feels like a long haul, and then they come up again at the end, or they suddenly realize in year two what they don't know, and that can be quite daunting, and again, tend to sort of improve as they get nearer the end of their degree. So, yes, so we have lots and lots of pictures which you can look at in the, in the paper if you're interested. But just to finish, I mean, the question is, can we capture learning gain? Yes. So we were able to observe change, um, and we could measure some of these things. And what we did find was that the change is very different across different subjects, different academic disciplines, years of study, et cetera. So um, you'd have to be careful when you're doing this from a policy perspective to compare like with like. Um, but what I also learned was that student engagement is not trivial. So whatever we're going to do as a sector to measure learning gain, and whatever we're going to do in terms of thinking about this as a system regulation, we're going to have to be very careful here, because you can force students to fill these things in in a technical sense. You can make it part of their course, if you like. But actually getting to students to engage in a way that's really positive is going to be quite tricky. Um, yes, you can. we came up with measures that were on the whole robust, but the moment you start making it a requirement for students to fill in these things, and the moment that you um, provide universities with an incentive for their students to do really well on the assessment, you might... Um, undermine the robustness of some of these measures. Um, more positively, I think what we did show was that you, know, you can do this with relatively short surveys. So the potential for an institution, for example, to use this instrument for their own purposes to measure the learning of their own students is probably greater um, than uh, across the sector as a whole. What we also discovered was that there's a lot of variation within each group. Um, Learning gains are, are, are similar across similar students, but lots of variation by subject, by the stages, by student background characteristics. So if you were using this as a measure of what universities are doing, just as you did with the earnings, you've got to be sure that you're comparing like with like. So one of the issues for me was, OK, well, if subjects look quite different in their students' reported learning, what does that mean? Does that mean we should be comparing only within certain subjects as opposed to across subjects? So finally, um, my view on this is that um, the instrument that we've developed couldn't be, wouldn't be suitable to be used in a sort of high-level regulatory manner 
to do cross-institutional comparisons. I think it would be very difficult to get students to answer it honestly in that case, and uh, it wouldn't make for a very good uh, accountability tool because of that. But I think what we've done is, um, with the framework and in, with the instrument, is develop something that could be really useful for those working within higher education who are genuinely interested in trying to think about the learning of their students, trying to think about how we can design things differently to tweak course provision, to change the way uh, we teach things, to change pedagogy, and have at the end of it some evidence as to whether that's making a positive difference and whether you're doing it right. Um, and I think um, you could certainly say that institutions could use it for their own purposes, and because you've got an instrument that, you know, technically you could potentially compare with other subjects or other institutions if you did it carefully, um, I think it's got some value. So overall, I hope I've convinced you that our two attempts to think about how you measure quality in higher education have some strengths and have some weaknesses. Um, my reflection on this is that we do need to take the need to measure quality in higher education very seriously. I don't think we're in a world where we can just entirely let universities get on with it. I don't think students and parents accept that, and certainly the government shows no sign of accepting that as a, as a line of argument. And what I would say is that if we're going to measure quality, we need to do it really carefully. We need to develop these kinds of tools to do it in a way that's, uh, that's robust, um, and I think what we also need to do is think about the incentives that we don't want to set up for universities to game the system. We don't want universities, um, you know, passing everybody because that looks good on their metrics. We don't want universities only enrolling uh, men because they earn more and they're being judged on the earnings of their graduates. So what we want is to be really careful when we're measuring quality that we don't provide unfortunate incentives that will undermine the real value of higher education. And perhaps the most important thing in that respect is not all higher education is about earnings. And so whatever we're going to do on, on measuring quality, we'd like that balanced with something that's not about the labour market, would be my view. But I'll stop there, and I'm sure you've got lots of questions. Thanks. Well, thank you, Professor Vignol. So, so fantastic application of research to things that are very close to home. The world has changed from the days when uh, students were lucky to be able to turn up and listen to the lecture um, because it was rather tiresome having to give one. They're now more like customers, but also uh, I think what's fascinating is the number of dimensions of quality uh, that I think still far too many university teachers, and I might even include myself in this, are not sufficiently aware of. Uh, it's not good enough just to go to the lecture and then regurgitate it onto the exam paper, clearly. So, uh, the old lags will know that um, we have a process here. Um, <clears throat> my lovely assistants, yeah, uh, these two anyway, um, <clears throat> will uh, keep an eye out and try in a fair <laughs> sequence, uh, pick up your requests to ask a question. And <clears throat> so please catch their eye rather than mine. And I will look to them uh, for who is the, the first or the next person, and that's the first person, please. It looks like a, a fantastic database that you've built up. Um, I'm wondering what it might tell us about socioeconomic um, influences within that data set, because there's a lot of emphasis at the moment, as you know, on trying to improve access to higher education for deprived groups, and particularly to, to Oxbridge. Um, so I'm wondering whether you've done some interrogations of that data set on that. Yes, so we've got a, a paper that's forthcoming on this, which is, I mean, to be honest, this was my main motivation behind doing, doing this research, but uh, given that I thought I'd talked to you long enough, I didn't get to it. Um, so what we have shown is that if you take two students with similar backgrounds, similar A-levels, from the same institution, studying the same subject, you still get... Uh, differences in their earnings in the labour market. So the first thing is there's a socioeconomic gap in earnings that you can't explain by which university someone goes to or which subject they take. Now, that could be, you know, discrimination against people who, you know, don't speak with the right voice, who knows? Or, more likely, it's to do with the fact that if you come from a more advantaged background, you can afford a longer job search period, 
you can afford to take the internships and the unpaid opportunities to make sure you get on that right trajectory. But what it means for universities is that if you're held accountable, if you like, for students' earnings, then if you admit a lot of students from poor backgrounds, you may put yourself at a disadvantage. And so when I said that we need to be really careful with the incentives we set up, the last thing we want is to set up an incentive for universities to not want to enrol poorer students because of what they might or might not earn in the labour market. Um, so, yes, and in answer, you might have also been wondering where poor students go to. On average, poor students are more likely to end up at uh, lower-paying institutions, but that is largely because of their lower prior achievement, not because of uh, not being admitted. It's because they get lower grades at A-level, by and large, on average. They mentioned 11 institutions, Russell Group, Bar one. Who was the bar one? <laughs> yes. So, um, yes, I mean, the aim from the instrument is very much to test it across the sector as a whole. It just happened to be that we had a Russell Group consortium who wanted to look at this. And I think it's not random. It was the Russell Group. I think they wanted to really focus on the, the learning aspect. Now, the one non-Russell Group institution came about because our... Um, director for another bit of the study, um, moved from Warwick to uh, Sheffield Hammer. And um, yes, and um, basically that was a really positive thing. And so it was possible to include uh, a non-Russell Group institution. But obviously for this to have any uh, validity across the sector, uh, our next stage will be to test it in a much more diverse group of institutions. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. In view of the sort of TEF-REF conflict, or tension, I should say, for institutions and academics, have you looked, do you have a view on, or have you researched, or have others researched, whether it's actually of benefit to student learning to have a strong research focus for an institution, mm -hmm. whether the coexistence of teaching and research in a yeah. higher education establishment actually benefits students? So this is a really important question. So... Um, the REF may have encouraged specialisation in research, particularly when you could select which of your academics you could put into the REF to be judged. Now everybody is in, uh, and there is evidence of academics being moved from a contract which includes research and teaching to just teaching, and that will be the consequence of them perhaps not producing the kinds of outputs that are seen as refable. So that's one aspect. Now, if TEF starts to bite in a serious way, and teaching quality in particular becomes really important, one could imagine a process that's the reverse, where actually there's uh, an, an incentive for un universities to have one bunch of staff doing research, one doing teaching, and you hope they're both excellent at what they do, and you get the greatest scores. All of that rather flies in the face of everything we believe about higher education, which is the interconnection between research and teaching. And yes, there is a body of evidence on that. Uh, it is quite hard to prove that students' outcomes are better as a result of um, the integration between research and teaching. But I think if you take a step back and ask particularly what some universities are for in terms of producing people who can go on and be the next generation of academics, it's very difficult to see how you could do that without having research and teaching somewhat integrated. But I guess you could imagine a world where that integration happens more at postgraduate level than it currently does. Yeah, in terms of uh, knowledge management theory, for example, according to Michael Palenny, <clears throat> where he distinguishes between explicit and tacit knowledge. <clears throat> I think the current educational model is based uh, both in teaching and assessment heavily on explicit knowledge. Um, this is also reflected in the labour market where companies state their requirements in terms of skills, which is also very much explicit knowledge. At the same time, some of the latest research are showing other factors as predictors of success, such as uh, curiosity and imagination, which are very difficult to measure. <clears throat> 
and also the <clears throat> trend in the world with automation. I mean, anything which, any task which can be uh, achieved using purely explicit knowledge is a prime candidate for automation. And we see this happening more and more. So the question is, uh, how can we, uh, in education, develop tacit knowledge? I, mean, I did see some signs of it in your framework. And the second question is, are we spending too much time trying to do what we're already doing more efficiently? And, or should we be teaching something completely different? Hmm. Nothing like a set of big questions there. Um, right. So the first thing, point is about explicit and sort of implicit knowledge, and also in particular um, this idea of what kind of skills or knowledge or attributes do we need in the labour market. I mean, you'll notice that our framework does reflect some of that precisely for that reason, um, you know, curiosity, interest in research, interest in knowledge, but also the idea of essentially setting up individuals so they can learn in the future, less about what they're learning now, more about setting up the lifelong attributes and, and ways of thinking that you need to make you a learner for the rest of your life. And it, maybe that's the distinction that higher education brings, that you're setting these people up for a lifetime of learning. I say all that, but you know, the dismal economist in me has to bring us back down to reality because the earnings data that you just saw do suggest that the labour market is still very much paying for some types of analytical skill. And I do think we need to be careful about what we mean by imagination. I imagine in the future that the person who has a very, very strong analytical skill, possibly flavoured with a bit of data science, with a massive amount of curiosity and a real imagination to apply it in different ways is the person that's going to be most protected from you know, their job disappearing due to AI and, and will be in strong demand. And, and, and indeed, you can sort of almost see that at the moment where um, the demand for, for imagination and data science as a combination is quite strong. So um, I think you're right. But some people have sort of used that as a, as a reason to think that we could turn our back on some of the more conventional um, cognitive skills that we spent, you know, quite a long time developing in our population. I'm not personally convinced that we won't need them. I think you just need more. <laughs> um, but it's a bit early to say. Um, in terms of the efficiency, um, you know, should we... I mean, you, you, you know, you can always make the case, should we be even spending the effort trying to measure teaching quality instead of getting on and doing it? Anybody who's worked in a public sector organisation over the last 20, 30 years, whether it's the NHS, schools, um, local authorities, a government gets sick and <laughs> tired of being assessed. Um, and I think we have to get our accountability systems right. It's a balance. Uh, I don't think you can have a system where there's no accountability at all, because if we turn back the clock, some public services didn't do so well when there was very little accountability. But equally, I could clearly see there's a strong argument that we've gone too far um, in, in some professions in particular. And once you start degrading the quality of the profession and taking away the autonomy of the professional, then you end up in a situation where your accountability system, far from measuring what you want it to measure, you've actually reduced the quality because obviously lots of people leave and go and do something else, teaching being one potential example of that. Thank you. There's a lot of talk in recent years about grade inflation and so on. Yeah. Um, looking ac across the board and comparing institutions, and, um, have, have you or anyone else done any work that sort of addresses questions such as, you know, going back to your graph, is, I don't know, a, uh, a 2 1 from Bolton worth the same as a, uh, a 2 2 from the LSE or anything? Is, is any work done on that cross institution comparability of degrees? So, well, it's interesting your phrasing is a 2 1 from X worth the same as a 2 mm. 1 from Y. Well, I mean, we can look at that in terms of earnings, and the answer is no. Um, they're not the same. Um, so, employers don't uh, reward individuals to the same degree. Um, it, there is a literature on grade inflation. Um, it's certainly an issue. Um, if 
the proportion of first class degrees is a strong metric in any accountability system, you're going to see more grade inflation. That's another example where you do need to be careful about the incentives uh, that you set up. I think the deeper question though is, do we confuse people with our grading system? So for example, are employers uh, you know, confused by the value of different degrees? And by value there, I mean in terms of the skills the person's likely to come in with. Um, and I think the answer is there is a bit of confusion and what employers often fall back on is relying on their own internal calculations of what degrees are worth the same. So they go to the Russell Group or they, and that's not good for students because in our data, I didn't show it, but some of the institutions with very good outcomes are not in the Russell Group. So it's not necessarily true that falling back on old categories is necessarily always the right way to go. Um, <laughs> So this might be another argument for an across-sector measure, but it's extremely tricky to bring that about. Um, and I would say what we should just make sure is that we don't build in grade inflation to our accountability system to make it worse. Thank you. Um, really interesting, and um, thank you for uh, the whole talk. But I, the thing that really intrigued me was the fact that um, with a much clearer idea of, of the way LEO works as a, as a data input into the wider TEF metrics in the future. I think that has a, a great potential for leveling out some of the problems of earlier versions of the TEF, perhaps because of the DLHE and many other metrics still relying on students once they've graduated, actually responding to those um, things as opposed to the data being culled from elsewhere, which is very useful. But uh, what intrigued me was on the methodology page, the last bullet point, you were talking about the um, the possibility for unobservable characteristics yeah. as having an, uh, an effect on um, the results potentially in, in certain areas. And I, I would certainly echo that. I'm just wondering whether actually perhaps under certain circumstances, you, taking a more subject-based approach actually might uncover that some of those characteristics in some subjects might be not so much unobservable, but we just haven't really unpicked the way of thinking about them in the right way yet. Um, mm. I mean one could pick many subjects, but but music, my first music degree, music was Western classical, Bach, Brahms, you could wear a berry on a Thursday if you were lucky. Um, and all of those who earned money from music did so outside of that environment because we couldn't actually discuss that sort of process at all. But when the first explicitly named non-classical music degree came in in 1993, um, suddenly we, we did find that there was a, a kind of um, a, a big return to sort of historical attitudes to the idea of what a, a quality music degree would involve long before those quality benchmarking devices were um, yep. put in place. And one then gets the potential for a quality degree to need quality students, i.e. those with high, tef, um, high uh, tariffs, and also a first study instrument, uh, which then implies something about the ability to access those Processes. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, but um, uh, yeah. So the the question is really about those um, unobservable characteristics, whether that in certain circumstances and certain subjects, that a subject-based approach might be a useful way of helping to unpick those. Yes. So I mean, that's an interesting question about. I mean, both the certainty and the accuracy with which we can measure some aspects of this, such as earnings and the difficulty of measuring other bits of it, particularly where we're requiring students to engage and respond and commit their time to doing assessments. So these, these are our challenges. And um, in terms of the sort of the idea that there are unobservable things that we can observe, well, I don't just use LEO, I use other sources of data that are smaller, so they're not whole cohorts, but they're much richer. And so you can ask um, students very early in their lives about their attitudes to career uh, or their parents' attitudes to career. And these things do predict their unobservables, but in some data you can observe them. And, um, you know, we can do clever things to try and really isolate the effect of, of the degree on earnings. But the issue really here is not can you do it under certain circumstances, is what can we do as a sector and I think your, your idea of a subject focus one is, is um, you know, looking within that is interesting. Um, I was going to put this up in case nobody had any questions, but um, I think what we need to think about is what it is that we want our universities to do. And I think it's very easy for us to sort of say, well, 
Um, university shouldn't be about labor market and shouldn't be about earnings. So therefore, we don't want to have anything to do with measuring earnings incorporated into any assessment of what universities uh, are doing in terms of value added. And I think there is a bit of a problem that because I do think students would like universities to help them um, get things that are useful in the labor market, even when you've chosen a degree that you knowingly went into knowing it was going to be difficult, you'd still like some help, some support. And I think by including student outcomes and by improving elements of student learning, just as putting in guided hours of, of, of time, of contact time, these all uh, focus universities' minds on how to make the best experience for students. And if they're done carefully and in balance with one another, they shouldn't distort too, too much. It's, it's getting that balance right. Thank you. <coughs> um, General at the back, you, you had the mic and then you let it go. Is it, <laughs> are you happy with that? All right, gentlemen here then, please. Has the whole subject been considered on an international basis in terms of what other countries are doing and other institutions are doing overseas? Really? Especially the UK. Absolutely pivotal question, I think. Um, the UK has led, if you would like to use that phrase, on public sector um, accountability frameworks, I would say, in the sense that we have developed in that direction far more than many other countries. There aren't many other countries that are subjecting their higher education to these kinds of assessments. There's some stuff going on in the US where, and particularly, there's certainly a debate in the US about the quality of provision, particularly at the bottom end of the market. So don't get me wrong, I think there are debates about this going on in other countries. Um, but we need to be a bit careful here because if we are the only ones, uh, country doing sort of very high profile um, you know, quality assessment. We need to make sure we're not putting ourselves at a disadvantage in relation to other countries by making out that something wrong with our sector when actually UK higher education is, is one of the strongest in the world and we should be you know, celebrating that, not sort of making it look bad. Now, of course, you're probably sitting there thinking, but hang on, you know, we have league tables. We do. So there are global higher education league tables uh, that are now extremely well developed. So if you ask me what students are currently using, they are using the Times Higher and a few other, um, I think The Economist has one and a few others, uh, rankings. Many of those rankings are based primarily on research. But that's what students are using at the moment. Lady here. Thank you very much. Um, developing a suitable psychometric within a quantitative um, model is notoriously difficult for looking at um, human behavior. And I wondered if there might be quite a, a different approach completely really, to do what you might call would be an ethnographic study, to send people out to do close observational field work, as it were, mm -hmm. to actually observe what's going on, to see how people interact, and to see what outcomes are actually at the time. And I know this was done within business organisations, you know, in the 70s and 80s, and a lot of work was done on looking at how businesses actually work, and looking at organisational structures and uh, organisational behaviour behavior as a mm -hmm. field, as a, as a uh, category was sort of developed then. Mm. And one of the things that businesses time and time and time again came out with at that time was whether or not they were a learning organisation. It was, it was one of the things that uh, um, showed up quality organisations from others. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if, if, if my question is, has that been thought of as an approach, a methodological approach? Yes, so um, we weren't able to do an ethnographic study, but one of the really important points about our study was to do the, the uh, qualitative piece at the beginning. And the reason for that was exactly as you've said. Uh, the logical place to start is where students and HE providers and staff think they are, because otherwise you as the outsider are coming along and saying we're going to judge it on the basis of this. And what was really intriguing is the alignment between students and faculty members actually by and large in terms of the big stuff that they thought higher education was all about. So um, I think it's actually a fruitful area for further work. There is ethnographic work on this going on as well. It wasn't from us uh, in the US and the UK. One of the challenges though is, uh, is, is, are you trying to work out what higher education or particular institutions are doing in terms of learning? Or are you trying to devise a system that you hope will protect students from enrolling in something that is either not what they expect or that is low quality? And those two things are quite different. And one, you know, I think the thing I found most challenging in this body of work is 
is, uh, you know, I, I, I'm treading a line here, and I certainly don't want to take a kind of reductionist view of the, the, the aims of higher education, but it's difficult. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I work in evidence-based teaching. That is, we run training courses for teachers in, the, in, in helping them use the methods which are most successful in, in achieving good learning. And it occurred to me, listening to you, that it, has anybody thought of, instead of measuring the learning, measuring whether teachers are using effective methods? Yes. OK. So... Um if we take it as given that we know what an effective method is in every subject and in every context, I still might worry about measuring whether or not they're using effective methods. And I say that because in the school system, we have seen some quite negative effects from trying to focus on what teachers do. Because however well-intended, um, trying to observe teachers and uh, do lesson observations and try and capture quality in that way, you can often end up with a tick box type of culture where you're looking for the teacher to exhibit particular kinds of behaviours. Um, and, you know, that model, which I think Ofsted has moved away from now, but it was extremely expensive and very stressful for teachers. And there wasn't really good evidence that it was producing the genuine changes in teacher pedagogy that you would like to see, so much as the inspector coming in and making sure they've observed X and Y. Now, of course, there were fantastic Ofsted inspectors. Many of them did a fantastic job and could see through the difference between someone going through the motions and someone doing it genuinely. But I think observing what teachers do is, is quite tricky. Um, and if you think about what Ofsted costs relative to the regulator that they're proposing for higher education, you would need a massive scale to, to take that route, and I think they opted not to. Uh, whether that comes back as an option, I don't know, because you're right. I mean, ultimately, if you're wanting to know about teaching quality, you might actually have to go in some classrooms and observe teachers doing what they're doing. Um, but it comes with some, some notes of caution, I think. Just out of I'm sorry to interrupt, madam, but do, do you have a particular question you'd like to put? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, th yeah, th I thank mean, you for your input. I think that the, the thing there is that there are two distinct models here. One is that you have people going into classrooms trying to observe effective ped pedagogy, and I express some reservations about that as a system. The other system which you're describing, which is where students essentially grade the, the, the professors or their teachers on quality, which in essence is what the National Student Survey is sort of doing, um, that, as you rightly point out, has some quite major problems. And my suggestion is that you need a lot of cake, because if you provide cake in your lectures, your scores go up quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, can I, uh, I'm now on the clock, so there are two more questions. Can I ask you 
to ask them in succession, and then perhaps I need to be kind enough to answer them both. Sir. A nice quick one. Um, does any, did any of your measures identify students that ended up taking the entrepreneurial route and started businesses, or is that too rare an occasion? Sorry, I'm, uh, I have to ask you to repeat that. Yes, Sorry. Uh, do any of your measures account for the fact uh, or identify students that take up entrepreneurial yeah. activities? And one more question up there, please. This will be the last one. Uh, um, I, I was wondering about, in your conceptual scheme, uh, how you finished up with those categories, what their validity was. And I was interested in particular in the, the fact that um, the epistemological base seemed to drop out, whereas for many humdrum people, that might be one of the more easy ones to provide some criteria for that weren't socioeconomic. Yep. OK, so uh, coming back to your question, um, so we weren't looking at um, occupations in the data we have, and as yet, Leo doesn't have occupation. Um, however, um, one of the outcomes is uh, a high-skilled job, and um, I think there is a lot of consideration at the moment about how you could link Leo to occupations, and that would get you where you need to go, which is recognising that entrepreneurial outcomes might be far more positive than any earnings data would suggest because of the potential of those people doing things in the future. Uh, and indeed, they might have very low earnings, of course, because you know when you're setting up businesses or whatever, that, that's a period of things. So um, I think it's on the radar, but it's not in our data. Um, yeah, in terms of um, the validity, uh, in the interest of time, I didn't produce all the descriptive statistics. They're all in the paper if you want to have a look. Um, the epistemological um, item drops out not because it's not important. I'm definitely not arguing that it's not important. What it is is that we failed to be, a to be able to measure it with the tools that we had, and we tried two different attempts at it. So I think what it is is it's particularly challenging um, uh, to actually get students to be able to articulate that in this kind of setting. Um, and once we started getting into it and we tried twice, we, you know, we found other papers where they've also failed to do the same thing, which is quite interesting, because like you, I would have thought epistemology would have been one of the more straightforward ones, but um, it's actually quite difficult. But if you're interested in the, um, the validity and the reliability, the paper, uh, the slides can be available and they, they, they give you all the numbers that you might want. First Vignoles, thank you for an absolutely smashing evening. Um, Education is one of those things that we've all had, so we're all experts, and it's wide open for subjective opinions. And I think what you've shown very clearly is that we can bring some real science and really then the application of that research to really important policy matters. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much.